So we continue speaking about Yaakov and Isav and the whole scandal with the you know taking the brachot from Yitzchak. Uh, so there is this midrash that goes in line with the you know Isav being wicked that discusses the reason why uh, Yitzchak lost his eyesight in an old age. Um, they said that that was Hashem's gift to its haq, so he wouldn't be embarrassed by his son. That if he goes out, as long as he has, he has his eyesight, he could go to the marketplace. And people to oh you're Asaf's father that wicked man so he'd better stay home. Davar aher leadam gadol sheitalo tarkinin naaum shubahat vayush chenim sofim kash vatevin umarim ashan beada halon alach besatam et halon. It says or a wealthy person. It's a different analogy. Who had a nice uh, a nice hall, a nice uh, uh, guest room. It's in. in uh, it's a word that came from Greek and made its way into the Hebrew, Traklin. It really means, uh, it comes from, not, sorry, not the Greek, the Latin. It's three clinium, three recliners, because this is how people used to sit. They would lie down on bed. So usually you had, people had two guests, enough, you know, more than that. So three clinium is Traklin. So he had this big uh, Traklin, and, uh, but his neighbors, we're doing barbecue outside. The kasha, they, they're not really, they're burning hay and straw. Someone is a pyromaniac, is burning stuff outside. I know about that. You know about this one, right? So, uh, and it all comes through his window, so he, he, he had to seal the windows. So, and the, the analogy is, Neshe Isav, Ovdot Avodah Zarav, Yitzhak Rehu Metzer, Miat Kahu Arnav, that Yitzhak's wives are uh, worshipping idols and the the incense that they burn for their idols bother Yitzhak, so he lost his eyesight. It's like Hashem protected him from seeing it. Those two midrashim that are like come one at the heel of the other contradict each other. Because one of them says that Yitzhak didn't know that his son was wicked. And the other one says that because of the wickedness of, of Asav and his wives, uh, this happened. So I remember personally that when I was in uh, elementary school, I, yeah, I had the merit of having an amazing teacher in, I think it's like, I had to be first and second grade, because I remember some of our discussions, and I remember that she asked this question, why did Yitzhak turn blind? And I answered, probably because I heard it from my kindergarten teacher, that it was because I said was wicked. And she sort of, not rebuked, but she reprimanded me on, like, you think that, and that's, I think, is a, a, first of all, I think it's an amazing thing for teachers to engage children, even at that young age, in a, in a responsible uh, dialogue, not, you know, talking to a lot. Because I remember that from, from first or second grade, that she said, do you think that because uh, of Asaf's behavior, whether it was good or bad, his father has to suffer and lose his eyesight? So she made me think of it in a, in a different way. Um, and... I think really we have to look in the Midrash and it cannot be taken literally that uh, maybe Abel Azar ben Azariah spoke of his own experience of talking to parents that sometimes parents are so embarrassed by the way their children behave that they detach themselves from it. They don't want to see them. They ignore them, which is not a healthy thing. Because if you think about what happened eventually, it's hard not seeing what Esav was doing whether it was really evil, or like we mentioned previously, just a matter of callousness or, or more being engaged in the moment, whatever it was, it caused Yitzhak to lose contact with Yaakov and with Rivka, which is not good. So one always has, I think the Master of Midrash, one should not shut his eyes to what is happening around, but rather always be with an open mind and understanding where other people stand. In many cases, you know, I know of families where parents disconnected from their children because they thought they did something wrong. It's very, very common. And, or siblings that disconnect from each other. And then what happens 
is that years later they look back and say, well, this is terrible. I lost years of my life doing that. I should have, uh, from the beginning, uh, solved the matter. But sometimes it's too late. Sometimes it happens after, uh, after a person passes away. One particular case that I had, I had a, um, and that was a year that my Rosh Hashanah was very, uh, very gloomy because I was affected by the incidents that happened in the community that uh, there was a, a father and son. The father was in his 80s. The son was in his 50s. And they were so bitterly uh, fighting and, and, and sort of disengaged from each other that the father said, I don't want my son to be in my funeral. That's what the father said. And as it turned out, unfortunately, it was, this is what happened, because the son died before the father, in the same year, a couple of months apart. Mm. And I said, what, what, a, what a tremendous loss for both of them, of course. you know, that they have such closeness and they don't have it. Uh, then that, so this is one thing that I think we have to have in, in mind with the Midrash. Not uh, as a, this is a, a punishment or protection from God, to block its heart from looking at itself, but rather as this is a this is a cautionary tale. Do not shut your eyes from anyone, um, unless you know if a child, if uh, someone does something which is uh, dangerous to the public, it has to you know be given into the police or to the judicial system. But other than that, when those are disputes about how religious a child is, or you know, we have, always have to find ways to uh, to reconcile and to find a way to negotiate. But there's another explanation of why it's Haklos is eyesight. Right? So this is what the angels were crying. We say it in Oked Vani Akadah Mizbeah. Towards the end, Vayehemu Kol Malachi Merkava Ofan Vesaraf Shalim Bin Dava. That the angels were crying and praying for for Yitzhak, and their tears dropped into Yitzhak's eyes, and they remained there. And because they came from this fiery source, you know, at old age, Yitzhak lost his eyesight. So there are different ways to see it. One interesting interpretation that I heard in a lecture from uh, Dr. Aviva Zornberg, who had uh, several interesting books on, uh, on, the, on the Tanakh, she said that uh, it is proven now scientifically that uh, if a child has a traumatic experience, definitely more an adult, but if a child has a traumatic experience, it could affect his eyesight at an older age. Something if, uh, so this uh, would have been a very traumatic experience for its hug. The question is, for me, with that interpretation, is that, uh, like I said, its hug should have been at the time of the Akedah, at a very tender age, maybe four, maybe five. Some say Ibn Ezra says twelve. I'd rather have it in an age that he didn't understand anything of what was going around, just really vague concept, because otherwise it would be very cruel for God to put him in that situation, to think that his father is about to kill him. So if it was at a young age, his father would have been saying, you know, you know it was just a, a, a joke or whatever, but would be able to cover up for it. If he's an older age, that would be a big problem for me to understand how God asks him to do that. And of course, there's no question that he was not 37 years old, as the Midrashim say. There's no basis for that. It's not only... Uh, Impossible in terms of the pasuk. It's even ridiculous to think that that Isaac was a man led to the akeda. He was either a young uh, boy, like Ibn Ezra says, maybe twelve or thirteen, or maybe even younger. I think. But the other way to to look at this midrash is an amazing, uh, uh, you know, visual image that Isaac lying down and the and the angels above are like a mirror reflection. Uh, of each other. 
And this is something that in modern times in Israel, someone reflected in a song, maybe Rami, maybe you remember, Keshamalachim Bukhim Be'olam Aher, as Gam Be'olam Azir Atsub Anu Yoter. As if to say that uh, when the, the, the modern Israeli song says, when the angels cry uh, in, an, in, an, in another world, we are sad, sadder here in this world. And the idea is that there is a uh, sort of a relationship between men's suffering and the whole world. So the angels, angels really represent in Tanakh, if you look in Tanakh, up until the book of Daniel, up until the book of Daniel, we don't have uh, names of angels. There's only a concept of Malachim. And it seems more that the Malach is the sense of messenger. Because this is the, the, the meaning of the word in Hebrew, Malach is messenger. So Malachi Hashem are the messengers of God. Uh, and we say it in the Tehillim on Shabbat, on Bachin Afshi, Oseh Malachav Ruhot Mesharetav Eshlohet. Hashem created the wind as his Malach, as his messenger, and the fiery volcano Eshlohet, or the heat, is his servant. Meaning that the, the, the forces of nature are God's servants. So what the Midrash says is that when, uh, when man is suffering, nature suffers. There is this con- immediate connection between man and nature. And you know, we think it's ridiculous, like it's uh, very abstract. Mm-hmm. But what happens when men fight with each other, usually? They destroy nature. They burn forests, they, they dry wells, they poison wells, they, they destroy homes. And eventually that will come back and affect other humans as well. So the, uh, the message here that I see is that this, this kind of a, of a channel between the human and the divine is also a message of how we have to, to deal with other humans and with the world in general. Um, but anyway, this is, those are the different interpretations in Midrash on, uh, about Yitzhak's blindness. <coughs> All right, one more, one more Midrash. Now we move into the Bracha. A lot of midrashim on that. It's a very intriguing story. So this is from a later source. This is from the seventh century. He calls says He says it's Hakol's son. It's the night of Pesach, which obviously is not, uh, you know, it's a, it's a projection of from Hachamim's time, from the time of the of the author, seventh century, to the past, because it's Hak did not celebrate Pesach, All right? Nobody's in Egypt yet. There's no Exodus. Why would he do that? Uh, but it, they wanted to depict that night as a crucial night. It's the night of the creation of the Jewish people. So Yitzhak, they now make this sort of a, a choice that Yitzhak makes. He is going to anoint Esav as the founder of the Jewish people. And he calls him and he says, everybody says Hallel that night. That's a night to praise Hashem. So I want to praise Hashem through the blessing that I'll give you. V'ruach HaKodesh v'shiva v'omeret al tilham et lehem ra'ayin ve'al titav lematamotav. And while Yitzhak was saying I want to give you my blessing. God was saying, like a divine echo, was saying, quoting a verse from Mishlei, do not eat the bread of a wicked man and do not uh, crave his offering. As, so here we already have, remember as we spoke that about the fact that in Tanakh, Asav is not wicked. He's, a, he's a, maybe not the one that you want you want to move into your apartment, maybe be a roommate. Right? Maybe he could be a, a tough person, not a wicked person, not a rasha. But later on, this character developed because of uh, the war between Edom on the other side of the Jordan with the Israel, with Bnei Israel, with the Jews, and later on because it, he was identified with Rome and the Christian uh, uh, Empire, Catholic Empire. By the seventh century, Isav is already marked as the other and the wicked and and Christianity. So here we already have divine intervention. God himself tells Yitzhak, 
don't eat the food of Esav and don't give him a blessing. And so God supports Rivka in this rendition of the story. Uh, so the flip side of it is, Halach Esav le'aviv and it'akev sham. Esav went to bring food and he wasn't able to find game because God prevented him. Every time he saw a deer or a gazelle or something that he wanted to hunt, it ran away and it dragged him. So meanwhile, God provides the time and, and, uh, and leisure for Yaakov and Rivka to, uh, to deceive its heart. Amra Rivka le Yaakov, Beni alayla ze otzrot tlalim niftehu bo, alayla ze ayonim orim shira, that night the, uh, the treasury or the, uh, the uh, dispensers of dew are open, and this also shows us it's a late midrash, because the prayer, the prayer for tal, for dew on Pesach, was not established until the 4th century, so it's a very late late midrash. And she says, Tonight, even the, the angels sing and praise God, so go bring the food to your father so he can bless you. So the difference between what Yitzhak tells Esav and Rivka tells Yaakov is Yitzhak says, people are praising God, and Rivka says, the divine worlds are praising God. As if to say that what Yitzhak did was more mundane, more, more based in this world, what Rivka did was supported by the divine powers. And so this is how we see that the, the story moves from the biblical story where uh, Esav is not wicked and the, the sequence of events later on in Bereshit tells us that Yaakov did not do the right thing because he got into one trouble after another to this Midrash which come, comes 700 years after the destruction and tells us that Esav is wicked and God is with Yaakov and Rivka when they do the whole thing. We'll stop here for today.